All right, good morning. It looks like uh, it is nine o'clock, so uh, if it pleases the uh, vice chair stepping in for our chair who's absent today, uh, we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Okay. All right, um, since this meeting is called to order, let's go ahead and do a roll call. Uh, Justin Raines. Here. Uh, Jay Kaufman. Here. Kevin Martin. Here. Gary Clark. All right. Um, chair, we, we have our vice chair who is filling in for Gary. We have a uh, quorum. Uh, let me go and read the notice of meeting uh, into the record. Uh, notice of the August 22, 2024 meeting of the Board of Examiners for Land Surveyors, including date, time, and location, has been noticed uh, to the Land Surveyors website since July 5th, 2023. Additionally, this month agenda has been posted on the website since August 12th, 2024. Um, also, um, we'll have a public comment section at the end of the uh, at the end of the agenda, per usual. Um, but just a good reminder: if anyone is present, um, to go ahead and sign in to our sign-in sheet up here at the podium. But also, um, those that are attending online, if they uh, want to, when we get to that place, if they want to go ahead and sign in the chat box uh, indicating their desire to speak, that would assist us as well. And then also, just one announcement that I'd like to pivot to. Um, Laura, uh, you know, of course, know Laura Martin. She's our chief counsel, and uh, she would like to, um, uh, I think, before I, I won't spoil it for her, I'll, I'll just shift over to her, but she'd like to make a quick announcement. Good morning. Um, I think I've met most of you, but as Glenn said, I'm Laura Martin. I'm chief counsel of this program. Um, so we've had, a, we've had a little bit of staff changes, and in the interim, um, I've kind of been serving as your program attorney alongside Erica. Um, but... Uh, just recently, we were able to. Do you want to? Yeah. Um, so you're not losing Erica. Don't worry. But uh, <laughs> I'm just asking her to <laughs> to give Kyle uh, uh, her seat for a second. This is Kyle Johnson. Kyle has been with our department for about a year and a half, um, serving on a few other programs. But we're we're sort of moving assignments around a little bit, and so he hasn't really dug in on the work yet on this board, but I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you. This is Kyle Johnson. This is going to be the program attorney uh, working with Erica and Glenn as we move forward. Yes, it's great to meet you all. As Laura said, my name is Kyle Johnson. I've been with the department for about a year and a half working for the contractors board. Just a brief, brief, brief background about me. I grew up in Middle Tennessee, uh, went to college in Pulaski, Tennessee law school in Knoxville, private practice for a couple of years, and then I've, I've been here ever since. So I'm really excited to look and look forward to working with you all. Yep. It's great to meet you, Kyle. Uh, welcome to the, to the party and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kyle. We'll look forward to the days ahead. And uh, contractors already broke them in for us, so that, that's good news. And, um, you know, Gary will be pleased that he's a fellow East Tennessean, so I imagine there might be a couple uh, UT football fans among us. So, um, you know, Kyle, keep us updated on that. All right. Looks like we can uh, move on to the uh, agenda then. Um, you have that agenda before you. Um, is there um, any uh, edits or requests as far as uh, changes to that? Move to approve. All right. We have a motion from Jay Kaufman to approve. Do we have a second? I second the motion. Got a second from uh, Kevin Martin. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? All right. Hearing none, then agenda's approved. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, May minutes. Any um, edits there? There's no edits, changes, or revisions. I move to approve the minutes. Got a motion from uh, Mr. Kaufman to uh, approve the minutes. Do we have a second? A second. Got a second from Mr. Martin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none then, that's approved. All right, uh, professional society report. All right, uh, let's take a look and see if we've got anyone uh, in the meeting here. Let me check the... Don't worry, Kyle, we won't make you give the professional society report. So, <laughs> uh, Jimmy, are you on uh, online? Good morning, everyone. I am Mr. Glenn. How are you doing this morning? Can good. you hear me? Th yes, sir. We can. Thank you, Jimmy. Go ahead. Good. Good. Uh, good morning to everybody. I, again, I appreciate y'all being able to uh, accommodate us to attend virtually. That's that's unbelievably helpful for those of us who live over in the uh, western Tennessee or, or not not in the greater Nashville area. Uh, things have been pretty quiet uh, as far as TAPS go since our, our uh, conference. Everybody, from what I understand, is busy. Uh, we are gearing up for some more uh, uh, public outreach with our uh, uh, Tennessee Land Surveyors Outreach Program. That's that's starting to have some positive results. Um, uh, just believe it or not, we're we're already full steam ahead on getting ready for our spring conference uh, for next year, 
and uh, lining up uh, venues and whatnot for uh, for the next couple of years. So uh, as of right now, it's kind of quiet. Uh, we are uh, our we'll have our our, our annual uh, fall meeting uh, September twenty first uh, up in the Nashville area, and we will be uh, installing our new new officers for the for the next year. Or so. Um, looking forward to that and there's not not probably won't be a lot of new names on there so um but just just kind of keeping on with the status quo all right very good jimmy appreciate it all right thank you justin thank you sir all right um looks thank like you. we're then ready for the uh education report you know you have that before you it's um any uh questions in regards to that or okay. comments Nope. Anybody got anything? No comments. Need a motion to for approval? No. Figure out. Motion to approve as listed. Got a motion from Jay Kaufman to approve the education report. Do we have a second? I second. Got a second from Mr. Martin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, then we can move on to the director's report. Um, this will all be um, largely informational. I don't believe there's any action uh, action items, at least not for this meeting. Uh, perhaps when we get in the CE audit discussion, that'll that, that's really we'll reserve the bulk of that for. Uh, we'll introduce a couple topics, but we'll get in the bulk of that discussion at the next meeting. So uh, to see if there's any actionable items there. But right now, just informational purposes, um, we can start with the uh, budget report. Probably a good idea if I got there too. All right. All right, you got the budget report there in front of you. Uh, we're closing out this fiscal year, as you see. Um, it's trending uh, as you would expect. Uh, once we get, once we clear uh, our our biennial renewal cycle, then we're back in the red for a while. But that's you know to be expected. Um, but we're still in the uh, we're in the uh, surplus range of 152,908. Um, a couple of line items of that you know particular interest that jumped out to me. We're really only looking at April through June. We covered everything up to March uh, in the last meeting. So uh, I'm going to hone in on those last three months. Um, but in March, under technology expenses, you will notice a large reallocation there. Um, that, that was a little unusual. The refunds were for LAN, WAN, WAN. They, those were initially billed for board members. Uh, since board members don't have network access, STS issued refunds when it was brought to their attention. So, you know, although you guys are for purposes of reimbursement considered uh, an employee as volunteers you're not you know in the in the truest sort of full-time sense uh, an employee so you would need LAN and you know WAN access so that just was an improper billing that just needed to be removed so hence that reallocation there um, so that's good um, you know we try to you know we're as fiscally conservative as we possibly can be and want to watch our budget so I'm um, glad to have that back in the back in the purse uh, under other expenses in April, you will notice another reallocation. I discovered that some uh, A&E travel initially was debited to land surveyors. So I guess you guys are just the whipping post uh, lately. So we, we got that back too. Um, but so that correction is now represented there. Uh, also received a credit back from data processing under technology, of course, in March, as you notice. So um, um, so that, that's a win for us, a couple wins there. Um, but you know that's why we look at the, uh, the report each each month. and. Uh, make sure that everything's tracking as it should be. I didn't see anything else that jumped up. Those are the two main items that I that I noted. Other than that, things look pretty consistent with what we've seen in the past. Do you have any questions or concerns or comments? Uh, the only thing that stood out to me was um, was that we actually had case revenue. I assume that was from one of the prior consent orders mm -hmm. I think we had issued. I yes, think sir. I read Mm -hmm. that, that was it. So that, that stood out to me other than that. I'll yeah, that was a big chunk too. I'm glad you said that. Um, yeah, when you see that $4,000 hit, that's, that's I mean, not rather a hit, but a, an increase to our budget. It's good to see that we're collecting, so good deal. All right. Um, thanks, Jay, for bringing that uh, up as well. All right, so uh, NCWS uh, annual meeting update. Um, I want to pause here, kind of as uh, before, I, I didn't have anything official. We, we had a little bit more action on the uh, engineer side uh, than what we had on the Lance Fair side, but we did have some movement there with the modules and the exams. And so um, is there, uh, we know Justin, of course, uh, Mr. Raines and Mr. Kaufman attended that. It was a good meeting. Uh, I think there was a, a lot covered, um, a lot of progress. Um, enjoy those meetings to sort of get out of our silos and, and share and, um, and coordinate and, and collaborate with some of uh, the other jurisdictions, just to understand what they do and how they're organized. And, um, and you know, kind of um, and by that comparison, if there's any best practices that we can adopt or, or that we can lend, then that's a good opportunity to do that in that collaboration. So I'll pause here if, it, if any one of you would like to add something in, in that regard specific to land surveyors. 
Uh, no, I'll just say this, this was my first annual meeting and uh, it's, it's been very enlightening and it, it, it really is a good opportunity to, you know, kind of mm -hmm. have a measuring stick and see how we operate versus all mm -hmm. the other boards in the country and, and what we do well in areas we can improve. So um, I think it's a very worthwhile um, endeavor and I'm uh, very glad I went. Thank you, Justin. If I could add just one thing, I think um, specific to the surveyors is the progression of the PS exam is it's going to be modified eventually. But it is making progress. It's slow, but it, but it is it is coming our way. Um, uh, and especially ad adaptation of the uh, PLSS uh, module, so to speak. Um, that's something I think at some point uh, this board is going to have to address as to whether we will or won't require that module. Um, that's for later discussion. But um, as far as the breakdown of the PS exam into its separate separate modules, it's still coming. It's still coming. So for those uh, surveyors looking to the future to the to possible licensure in those exams, it's something that they'll need to start getting up to date with. And that's another reason. I was glad you mentioned that. I was like, please don't make me get into the, the nuances of the PLSS exam. I could not wax eloquent on that. But uh, the, the concept of those modules, I think that was a smart um, – way to solve that problem instead of changing the PS exam for everybody for, for areas of competence that they don't need in their respective jurisdictions. Just adding the modules was smart. Um, and then you can go a la carte. But to your point, that's another reason why we attend these meetings because when the industry indicates they're going to do something, that will trickle down to the individual jurisdictions. So it's just a good opportunity for sort of forecasting to know what's coming and then brace for that. So thank you for mentioning that that is coming and it is something that we'll have to address and decide as a board. But right now until that's until that's final and we get a chance to look at it, uh, there's, there's no action right now, but, but it is coming. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. Um, looks like then we can move on to uh, CE audit. I just want to give you a quick little update on that. Um, all right. All right. About 9% of those randomly selected um, appear to be short the necessary PDHs and will be referred to legal for further review and a potential um, agreed citation. According to the agreed citation um, schedule, that was approved back in February 2023. So, um, you know, Erica is going to get a look at that, but we're, we're not going to, we'll, we won't surprise her. We'll definitely give her a warning that that's coming. But it wasn't a lot. I mean, a lot of our folks were compliant and we're still working through some of that, trying to give everyone every opportunity to, uh, to prove that compliance, not to get compliant, because if you weren't compliant then, you're, you're, you're not compliant, you know, but to at least prove that compliance and get the necessary paperwork and respond. So we've been a little lenient with the, with the timeline and that response just to make sure they have every opportunity. But we're, we're about wrapping that up. So I'd say here next couple weeks or so, or, you know, when, um, when Erica's at a good place, we'll send that over to her. But it's, it's a little more than a handful, but about 9% of those that we, uh, that we pulled for audit will be coming her way for further review. Um, then there was just a couple things that I want to int introduce as well. Um, there was, uh, and this will probably be discussion for maybe the next couple meetings. It, there's not necessarily a rush on it because it's all related to CE audit for which we just completed. So this, you know, we won't have another one of these for another year and a half or so. So we've got time to figure it out. Um, but I wanted to introduce just to kind of get the board thinking about it. And when we have our full board and Gary's here, then we can have that discussion then, maybe November or thereafter as well. Um, but Per, I'll just read a couple items. Per Rule uh, 0820-05-02, PDHs are defined as, quote, an hour of continuing education found acceptable by the board. And so for those courses submitted that have not been pre-approved and therefore do not have Tennessee a course number, um, one, one thing is I wanted to see if we would consider or at least have the discussion um, to model a little bit after uh, what the engineers are doing in the sense that um, they grant approval for known providers um, that meet the criteria as defined in the um, in their rules. They just basically through as the as the uh, board members work in tandem with the staff uh, as they have would have questions. Um, and if it's a known, like if it's Lucas or it's you know Taps or it's one of those type of courses, but they didn't get approval and they're not on our list, then um, and, and it fits the criteria of what continuing education is. Um, would the board be willing to consider allowing um, allowing staff to prove that? You know, Alabama Society of Professional Surveys is one. Kerr Seminars, Lucas Survey, PDU. Those are known providers. You know, et cetera. Folks that we we kind of can look under the hood. People that have given up, we can go and get that criteria. 
we don't have to do that. You know, we don't have to. I mean, we're land surveyors. We're not engineers. We can do what we want on this side of things. You know, you've got your own process. But, um, you know, one of the benefits of working with other boards is I can take some of those processes that are that are used elsewhere and then bring that to the board for their consideration. So maybe we want to do that. Maybe we don't. But um, just something to think about. We'll talk about it later. Um, let's see. Uh, also, they do a 5% on it. We do a 10% on it. Um, so something to think about. Maybe we don't, maybe we do it, but you know, we only do this once every two years. It's, it's a little bit more, you know, it's a little bit more manageable since we have lower numbers. It's even though we do it all at once, whereas there they do it every quarter, you know, so it makes it a little bit more manageable. So you're not 17,000 engineers. We're doing a 5% out of that every quarter. So it's still substantial, but you know, it's, it's only those that renewed. You're not doing the whole chunk, 17,000, whereas here we got what, 12, 13, 1400 uh, land surveyors and we are doing it all at once, you know, so a 10%. You know, you can do the math on that. Um, but um, if we could perhaps consider a 5% audit, I would recommend that. But that's just something to think about. Yeah, not, not to interrupt you here, Glenn. Um, I, I think when we, when we first entertained the idea of the audit process, there was discussion of at first we would do 10% mm -hmm. just to kind of establish the pattern with the thought that if things are going well, and this is a pretty smooth and we're right. not seeing just crazy numbers, that we would consider reducing that in the future, perhaps right. to five percent. That's just—I don't think we ever set a specific number that I recall, but but something along the lines right. of what you're suggesting there. So that I think that was the original intent of when we came in with the audit process that in the future we would look to reduce that percentage right. number. And I see Philip nodding his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I, and I, I was there for those conversations, so I, I do remember that, and that that was sort of the general feel of it, which makes sense. I mean, you kind of. You know, you're going to start with more and then reduce. You don't you don't typically go the other way. So, um, you know, that was a, that I think that was a wise decision from the board then. And, and but since we've done this a couple, we've had a couple iterations now. You know, I think it's it's an opportunity for us to think about it. Um, so again, don't have to make that decision now. But just want to introduce the two topics. You know, um, for at least for our next board meeting or thereafter. We've got time, so it's no rush. But you know, um, just time to think about it. Do, do you know off the top of your head the last cycle? What, what the percentages look like for people I that don't, met them. I don't. Mm -mm. To see if there was a trend there. Yeah. I, I, patterns seem to be pretty consistent. And so, you know, we're looking at right at 9% or less, you know, at this, this cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, and I think we can do even better than that with, I think, appropriate um, communication being sent out, clarification, which would be my next point. Um, I really want to do a sort of a robust, maybe, not necessarily an e-notify, but front and center with our website, some of, the, some of those clarifiers. Because you know, keep in mind, the, the 9%, right at 9% of, um, of what we audited that we're sending over to Erica, that's, that's, you know, that's pretty good. So you're looking at 91% that cleared. You know, yep. that's that's fairly good out of that that pool, and it wasn't a small you know group of folks. I mean, ten percent off top of you know land surveyor renewals, yeah. yeah so you're you're pushing you know somewhere near uh, near that amount. Um, but um, you know, uh, I do want to uh, as we make decisions about um, what is acceptable education, put that front and center to and associations really reiterate that because a lot of these folks fell short by a handful of credit. They're not, it's not like they didn't take any PDHs, you know what I mean? We're looking at the folks that we are sending over, they did take PDHs, you know? Some of them just don't qualify. And some, now some of them are, are deficient and that's, you know, you, you, can't, you can't count what you didn't take, you know? So that, that's on them. That's going to be pretty easy, you know. But some of these others, it was sort of a, you know, it, they were they had the the number, but they weren't approved courses. And so, you know, there might be some opportunities for us to really put that front and center and communicate that so that they're they're really clear on that. Um, any uh, yeah, any questions or comments? No, I'm done. I'm okay. done. Okay, uh, uh, two quick questions, uh, and and Philip may be able to answer the first one. Um, of, of the nine percent that we're talking about that did not qualify on PDHs, were were the majority of those out of state registrants, or were they no. in state, or is it just a general no. blend? Um, there was no no general blend. Okay, okay yep. general blend. Okay, second question was I think maybe Erica might be able to answer this one. Of those that were of the nine percent that did not qualify, what what is the standard procedure that's that's going forward for those nine percent? Uh, obviously, there's going to be some disciplinary action here. Is that something that that is going to come in front of us at the next meeting for approval, or is that because they're all the same violation that we've pretty much rubber stamped what that procedure is going to be, and each of these nine percent 
that are deficient are going to receive the same disciplinary yeah, you action. nailed it they're going to receive the same I it's agreed citation ske uh, schedule since you guys approved that in february 2023 I thought. um it's a ticket on the side of the road yep you know what i mean like you're there everyone gets a hundred dollar you know um um fine or a uh, fee and um, disciplinary action. I mean, they're basically that is disciplinary action. I mean, they're getting a fine, so that that'll show on their record, and that's yep. it. And if they agree to it, sign it. That's they don't come to court, you know. And in order for them to comply, is it number one, get your PDHs up to date for the for the deficiencies that you had, um, and then number two, obviously there's a fine involved. Number three, there's a what a letter put in their file, and then they're good. The, cit the citation will be in their file, mm -hmm. but I will say. If they don't sign the agreed citation or and or they don't come into compliance, right. then it would be come before you. Okay, that's what I figured. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. I'm good. Thank you. I had one question. Uh, is there a in this I, I should probably know this being on the board, but is there a I know we we talk about what we approve and so forth and what the classes that are approved. Is there a is there a point on the website where they can go and see pre approved courses mm -hmm. versus, you know I mean, if I was gonna take a PDH I would I would love to go somewhere where it told me, hey, this is approved rather than take it and go, oh, sorry. Yeah. So is that? Yeah, it's listed front center. Yeah. Like if they go to our website, there's um, there's um, uh, a column to the left and it's got CE courses or I forget what it's called, but it's pretty obvious. They, so they right. click on it and it has a running list of everything like the, our education report. This will show up on that now. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, it's all right there. So along those lines. Um, and perhaps this is for later on in new business, but I do want to discuss the topic of the minimum standards in Tennessee yeah. and acceptance of that. You knew oh, it was yeah. coming. Yeah. Um, is, is now a good time to kind of touch on that? Oh, actually, I was going to introduce it. It's just about, a discussion item. Want me to tee you up and then you can just take off? How about that? Let's go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Standards of practice rule 0820-05-0301 uh, uh, states, um, a minimum of two PDHs shall be earned by successfully completing a course or activity that has content areas focused on serving ethics and standards of practice. Of course, standards of practice, as noted in your um, in your rules, um, for past three renewal cycles, we have accepted other one-hour standards of practice courses, if not taken from those residents uh, that reside outside of out of the state. So we have accepted other standards of practice um, uh, um, in, for the last uh, couple of renewal cycles. Um, but that, and obviously that's uh, that may or may not be the intent. Gary has some you know some opinions about that too. So we wanted to you know save the, the obviously take off and you know into you know, fill that up. But then I know Gary had some some comments on that as well at the next meeting. Um, so get after it. Well, I think uh, uh, you know, Gary and I have had discussions with the other uh, Justin as well. Have had discussions about this topic. Um, I, I, I I mean on the surface of it, flat out. I don't think that was the intent of, of the board um, when the rule was created about minimum standards for Tennessee. And the rationale that I present is you know, the point is for the reassurance of the public that Tennessee registrants are following the rules established by the board of Tennessee. And, and the reason we have minimum standards for Tennessee surveyors is because surveying is a little bit different in every different state. In a broad, general sense, they're very similar, especially the ones that adjoin the state of Tennessee. But every state has its own little nuance, its own little niche about surveying, and Tennessee is no different. Um, and that's why we have specific rules and regulations to surveying in Tennessee. When we brought about, when the board brought about the requirements for ethics and minimum standards, it, it's it's my understanding and my recollection that the intent was somewhat as a refresher, so to speak, that, hey, don't forget, as a Tennessee surveyor, these are the rules that you have to follow as outlined by the board. Thus, we call them minimum standards. And that was kind of the point of why we want a refresher for every Tennessee registrant is if, if for nothing less, I'm not asking for a thorough study and, and dive into the rules, but a general refresher of, hey, these are the rules, make sure you're applying these to your surveys. Because it's easy that, you know, a lot of surveyors, myself included, have been doing this for 20, 25, 30 years. And you're putting out surveys left and right, and you kind of fall into a pattern, right? And, and when you're young and you've just reviewed the rules and you took your exams, you're, you're, by golly, by the book. But as time goes by, things tend to kind of wander sometimes. And not, not just in surveying, but in everything in general, right? Because we do it that way for one survey. You might carry that over to another survey, and pretty soon it kind of gets watered down. And so the idea was to kind of bring, bring that lost sheep back into the fold of saying, hey, 
Don't forget, Tennessee surveyors, here's the rules, here's the box that we're confined in, and the purpose of it is to standardize the surveys according to what the board set as standards, ultimately for the, for the protection of the public. And so my point here is, why would we as the board accept minimum standards from another state if we're to protect the guidelines of the standards to the public of the residents of Tennessee? I, it, many, many surveys, and, and a lot of this is geared towards surveyors that are licensed out of state. Let me give you an example. I'm, I'm fortunate to be licensed in other states, Arkansas, Mississippi, et cetera. And, and if I'm going to be surveying in those states, I've got to be held to those state standards. And they're a little bit different than Tennessee's, but like I said, in a broad brush, they're very similar. But especially in the PLS states, they, they have differences. And so I apply that same logic to Joe Surveyor who lives in, pick a state, Virginia, whatever. Born, raised, cut his teeth as a surveyor in Virginia, does 99% of his surveys in Virginia, but he's licensed in Tennessee because he's close by, and he gets that one or two surveys a year in an adjoining state in Tennessee of which he must follow the standards of Tennessee. But he's done so many standards to Virginia, he's taken Virginia standards, requirements, all his life. And, and the, 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 it's just the ease of it to fall into that trap of doing a Tennessee survey by another state's standards because you're most familiar with it is just too easy. And so I think the other states find the same rationale. Look, your minimum standards for your specific state should be to that state. What, what, what advantage does taking minimum standards in North Carolina do for a Tennessee surveyor? I, right, I, I'm a board member regulating Tennessee rules and statutes to surveying. I want to know that every Tennessee registrant is up to date and refreshed with Tennessee standards. I don't care about North Carolina. I don't care about Virginia. It's great that you're licensed there. All due respect to those states and their rules. But any surveyor that's surveying as a licensor in Tennessee is under Tennessee rules and nobody else's. That's why the minimum standards, one credit hour every two years, should be to this state. And that's all we should be looking at. I think it's great that you're taking minimum standards in other states. You, want to, you need to be keeping up to date with your state. I'm responsible for my licenses in other states. I take minimum standards in of other states for those states specifically. Why should any other registrant be any different? And why should this board accept minimum standards from, I'll pick another state, Vermont, if we're holding them liable for the standards in Tennessee. Why, why would we do that? It's almost a detriment to ourselves. And quite honestly, I think it's a disservice to Tennessee residents who are hiring Tennessee licensed surveyors to perform a survey to Tennessee standards. And we require, we accepted their standards from another state, that, that just doesn't make sense. I, I don't think it's a smart idea that we accept those. I, if we've done it in the past, that's my misunderstanding that, that I've allowed that through. I can tell you that in conversations with Tennessee registrants, I've told them that no, we're only taking Tennessee standards and that's it. And I know in reviews that I've received of, you know, PDH is accepted, I've, I've not counted those. Oblivious to the policy statement that was put in front of me not too long ago saying we accepted those, I was like, oh, I've been giving up bad information as a policy statement. That's not the policy that I ever recall or intended or I, I can't imagine I approved at any time. I hope I didn't. Um, but I know right now I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that policy statement at all. And I think this board needs to really take a fresh look at that and do what we can to change that such that for their requirement of that one PDH and minimum standards that we as a Tennessee board only accept those Tennessee standards. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I honestly wholeheartedly agree and wonder what the point of it is if it's not Tennessee standard. Why require it at all? I mean, you know. It, it seems like a, a meaningless, you know, uh, rule to, like I said, I mean, it, I, I agreed they're, they are very similar, but the, you know, the standards really get into the details, you know. It, it's not about how you survey in general, it's more about how do you prepare a survey for this state, you know, in this state, what are our rules? And those do vary. Um, I mean, they, there's considerable variation state to state. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with Jay. I don't understand the point of it if it's not specifically Tennessee standards. So, Is this, Jay, would you propose that we only accept Tennessee standards or, or is it, or your point is you're trying to make that, that we uh, need to, need to implement a requirement that each 
surveyor, each Tennessee surveyor, each year gets an update. They get a, they they're, they're required a certain amount of PDHs that relate to Tennessee standards. Yeah, it's 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 my point and, and goal, and, and I don't know that it will happen here today. But at some point, we as a board, uh, I feel, is in our best interest, and, and ultimately in the protection of the of the citizens of Tennessee who order surveys, to make it that way. That it's only Tennessee standards that is accepted by this board as that one PDH requirement. Now, it's a little bit a little bit hard to put that toothpaste back back in the tube since we've been accepting other states for a while. Is my understanding. But we need to make it clear, I, I hope we get to the point here, and sooner the better, that we make it clear to all registrants, Tennessee registrants, that if you hold a Tennessee license, you're required, number one, to have minimum standards, and it's going to be Tennessee minimum standards, that they're the only ones that we'll accept. Now, I know the argument, I think, used to be that the availability of that was difficult to get, especially if you lived in another state, let's say, you know, from one from a distance away, put a California in there. How, how is he, he or she going to be able to obtain that Tennessee minimum standard? Well, that's been resolved through, uh, you know, availability of, of online courses that, that meet our standards for, you know, PDH's acceptance. Those are more than available now. So that argument is, is, has gone down the river. Um, but I really, I, it, the ultimate point here I'm trying to make is I really think for the protection of the Tennessee landowners that we're surveying, that those Tennessee RLSs need to be held to the minimum standards of Tennessee and Tennessee only that we'll accept. What is the process here for a policy change on something like that? Oh, it, it's, it, Excuse me. Um, it's not, it wasn't a policy. It was an interpretation of the present rule in place that, that made that allowance. Hence the reason for this clarification. Obviously, if uh, uh, there, it, um, the two interpretations are completely allowed underneath that rule. And so, but the board, obviously, they write the rules, so they're, they're entitled to interpret their own, their own rules. And so, hence the reason of this uh, is uh, going back to the well and getting your input. Um, so, whatever the board decides, you know, within, when we'll you know, wrap that up here in the next couple of meetings. May not even be November, uh, may be the, the following one in February. But either way, we'll wrap that up before the next renewal cycle. So, and we'll robustly communicate that across and, you know, all the, and, and make whatever adjustments we need to make based on the decision of the board, uh, based on your interpretation as articulated to us and instructions in that regard. So, um, the um, one nice thing to kind of keep in mind is um, it is one hour, not to minimize it's an important hour. We, we you know, we need, uh, clearly, the it's uh, it wouldn't listen to rules otherwise, but um, so it's not like the gate was wide open. You know, it's we're, you know they they are still you know there's there's CE being applied and then they're still taking standards and some standards, although there are some uh, differences among jurisdictions as noted. Hence the reason for the modules. I mean that's why they they're they're offering that. Um, so. Um, there are some universals in those principles. If you were to, you know, read the standard, the standard practice, you'll see that that translates in a lot of way, kind of like ethics. You know, there's there, there's some universal um, principles there applied. So even with that standards of practice in other places, they're getting a lot of those same principles. Now the nuances, you know, that are unique to us, as you articulated, they're not going to get that. And so <clears throat> now, now, and also keep in mind too, they're also responsible for. Um, the rules, regardless of whether they're taking CE on that every single year. For example, they don't take um, uh, standards of practice in engineers, but yet they're responsible for it, you know, and so it doesn't keep us from enforcing it um, just because they're not getting an update, you know. So, again, we're still, um, they're still held to that um, and that, that same standard. So there's been no sort of diminishing of the standards as a result of them not, not getting a, a, an update. However, I would say too, and if we if we we may, I don't know if we will or not. That that's a discussion we'll have in the future. We talked about the NCWS uh, update, but if we um, if we do adopt the module, then maybe we maybe we could revisit this again. Then you know, because at that point they're taking the module that's specific to your to your state. If we're if we're going a la carte, so that's an added requirement that they didn't have before to the practical exam that's already in place. And so if we adopt the module then at that time might be a good opportunity to revisit the one the one year or the one hour um, biennial requirement for standards then you know maybe maybe not but you know that might be that might change the landscape is what I'm saying if we adopt that module but that's a what if maybe you know if I win the lottery sort of a conversation so we'll see we'll have that conversation then but um, 
So yeah, that's. I think we teed it up nicely. I think it's a uh, you know Gary. He'll he'll have something to sort of uh, chew on, listening back to this video later, and then we'll just pick up where we left off and uh, left off in November and, and February and and bring it to resolution. If I could just make one point here, um, it, it's not my intent here to kind of pull the rug from under those that have submitted minimum standards from other states with their understanding as is published on the website that will accept other states. That's, that's not my intent here. I'm not trying to go back in time and say, well, it used to count, but that's not where I'm going. I'm looking forward here. So I just want to make sure that's, that's clear. All right. Very good. Any more comments or discussion in that regard? No, I think right. we covered it. That was a good primer then. I think we'll be ready for November and February then, right? All right. Moving on then. Um, looks like we are ready for the legal portion, I believe, is where we're at next. We public, are. Public, our public, thank you. All right, let me pause for a second. Thank you, Jay. Um, public comment period relating to items on the agenda. Um, Alex, if you would take a look in the chat box, and if you're online, if you would sign in, if you would like to make any comments, I'll pause, look in, and um, for an opportunity for anyone that may be present as well to make comments. All right, looks like we have one then. We got a taker. If you could just go ahead and sign in too, that'd be great. Of course, we, we recognize this fellow, don't we? <laughs> Thanks. If you could go and introduce yourself just for those that might not be watching. Uh, Jay, right. Eddie okay. Uh, I'm Eddie Campbell, land surveyor. Um, I, I had a comment on the standards of practice. Uh, I, I present continuing education courses. Uh, I'll be submitting one for approval here in the next few days for this December. Uh, I only do one seminar a year in December for people that are running late with their <laughs> needs for continuing education. And it's usually the same group of a dozen or so that come and see me and they've been coming for years. Um, I've presented on ethics and standards a few times and I am amazed every time how, how much is learned if I can keep their attention. You know, it's, it's in, it's unbelievable to me how many are operating by the same individual standard that they did the last few, few decades, and they don't realize that they're, they're, they're getting out of bounds. And it's, I'm amazed by it every time. So I, I think, if anything, I uh, hope not a lot of people are listening. I, may get, I might get shot, but uh, I, think the, I think it needs an examination requirement uh, at at the end. And I know that most don't have that, but I, I've, I've considered it when I do the next one, which won't be this year, but next year, I, I'm considering doing a, a little test at the end just, just to make, just to put a fine point on it. Because it's, it's very important. The, these, these standards are very important uh, to me. And so that's it. Eddie, Eddie, appreciate what y'all do. Eddie, I appreciate you coming by. You're, you're great about coming to each one of these meetings. So. So stand up to you. Um, along those lines here, I think, I think TAPS has really come up with a very creative process or seminar on the minimum standards. Uh, for the last couple of years, they've done it almost, oh, they use an app. So all the participants in the audience, uh, of which there's three, 400 of us, all RLSs, are using your phone. It's an app, and you respond to the question that the presenter puts up. And, they're, and they're, these are questions on minimum standards. So you would think, just in general knowledge, that you ought to do pretty good as a group. And for the most part, they, they do pretty well. But, but I'll tell you what, it, as each question comes up, they show the results. They don't, they don't put you by name. You put a little trivial name, false name in there. But they give a little bar graph as to how many got it correct and incorrect. You would be amazed at how many are incorrect. Incorrect, which, which just kind of enforces the reasoning of why we do these refresher minimum standards. As to, and, and some of them are kind of trivial, but some of them are just ba what I consider basic minimum standards. By no means is that entire audience of you know current registrants getting the 100 percent on these things. Um, I mean, I'll admit I missed one or two. <laughs> I did get first place though, um, uh, which I should. I got better. Um, but but I think it's a great way to present it. But my point being is is kind of reiterate what you're saying is you're you'd be amazed at how many of these people taking the minimum standards courses if you give them a little quiz or just a yes no or a ABCD type selection are are incorrect. Just, just flattered incorrect. 
Yeah. I mean, so I, I end think up it with, shows its value. I end up with way too many credits every year because I go and take other people's courses, sure. uh, and, uh, and I've taken that one. I took it last year, as a matter of fact. And uh, that's a great way to do it. And it is surprising, the wrong answers that when absolutely. It, you get a little color. Yeah. And, and it, you get a little color bar graph. Of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. Okay, I appreciate what you all do. All right, thanks a lot, Eddie. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Is there any other comments on the screen or in the, or in the uh, room? All right, looking like that looks like there's none. In that case, then, we're free to move on to the legal portion of our, um, of our agenda. It looks like uh, the legal report. Thank you. Um, so for number one, which is 2024-014-001, um, I know normally I read all of this verbatim. Do you want me to do that with this one or more paraphrase it? Oh, well, I'm sorry. I, I would love for you to pair for Okay. I'm going to do my, I'm, I'm, I've kind of highlighted what I think is important. And then of course we can talk, we're going to talk about it. So um, I'll do my best. Uh, so complainant is a Tennessee resident and respondent is a licensed contractor. But I want to make it clear that at the time of um, the issues that were going on that led to this complaint, the respondent was not yet a licensed contractor. They were working on it. They were just a field agent for a surveying company. Um, but respondent's never been licensed as a, as a land surveyor. So complainant owned a developed parcel of property in a subdivision, bought an, un, uh, an adjoining unimproved lot in 2013. Complainant makes a lot of allegations in, in this matter, as you read. I just also want to make it clear that the complainant never provided anything to me, no documents whatsoever to support any of these allegations. Um, but I'm going to go over the ones that I think are you know, most important. So the complainant alleges respondent initiated contact with them back in 2019 via social, social media to inquire whether complainant, complainant wanted to sell their lot. Complainant alleged that respondent represented themselves to be a licensed land surveyor who was employed by a Tennessee surveying company. Um, let's see. Complainant alleges respondent wanted to purchase this land to build a home and then resell the property. Complainant did meet respondent and explained that they needed to reserve a 25 foot strip of property that they had improved substantially, and that was the only way they were going to sell. So complainant alleges that respondent told them that they could adjust the property line because they were a surveyor. Um, and eventually complainant agreed to sell this. It did not work out with the respondent to purchase the lot, but they brought another buyer. So apparently that deal did go through. Um, so really the main issue here for us to look at is these allegations that respondent um, held themselves out to be a licensed land surveyor. Um, but again, I have no documentation or, um, you know, there was a lot of allegations about Facebook messages. I don't have any of that. Um, complainant did hire an attorney and ha did file a lawsuit uh, on January 23rd, 2023. So as far as I know, that's still ongoing. The respondent's attorney who was representing them in that civil suit responded to this matter and Respondent just denies that they ever held themselves out to be a licensed land surveyor, explained that they were, they, they did work for their stepfather's land surveying company, which from what I can tell is very reputable. They have two licensed land surveyors on the staff. Since I wrote this um, legal report, I was able to get some depositions from that civil suit, and I got a lot of really helpful information from those depositions. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what's not in here that I found. So on the record in those depositions, complainant does confirm that respondent never initialed any of the drawings, signed any of the drawings, that these plats and drawings that were brought to them were all issued by the land surveying company and by those licensed land surveyors that the, that the respondent worked with. So I think that's really important. Um, and again, there's just, this matter is in civil court. So before, or when I wrote this, I didn't have as much information and I thought the best course of action would be to put this in litigation monitoring. Or if you wanted, we could investigate it, which would be 
as you know, you know that's that's going to take some of our resources. And it was my thought: we have this in civil court; it's been going on for a while. They're going to have all of the evidence that we need, and we can wait until there's a judgment. But based on what I've read in these depositions and the lack of evidence that the complainant can give me, I, I tend to think that my recommendation is probably just to close this matter uh, for lack of evidence to support these allegations. So. Um, if you want to discuss that or if you have any questions, you know, just let me know. Okay, any questions? I do have a question. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, the, the one area of concern for me was, I'm just going to read it from here. The complainant alleges the respondent placed markers with the land surveying company's name on them on lot 36 to mark off the 25-foot strip property. Okay, so again, alleges. Um, but if the respondent, who is the contractor. Now contractor. Now contractor, <laughs> not then, it's right. regardless. Um, set those corners, markers as they're put on here, but that's, I'm, I'm taking that as placed markers, physical markers to represent this 25 foot strip. That right there is surveying. Okay. So my, my question here is, who, who actually, it says the respondent placed markers. I'm, I'm visualizing that as this respondent physically was the guy in the field placing those markers in the ground. That's, that's what I'm visualizing here. Tell me where I go wrong. Is, he, is that respondent who placed those markers employed by the surveying company and under that direct supervision of that surveyor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's good to hear. And those licensed land surveyors signed the plat that was yeah, a result. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine okay. with that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that this respondent is yes. under the direct supervision of an RLS. Uh, yes, and it was his, okay. his, st okay. his stepfather, not that that matters, but. God. Okay, I got you. He no longer works for that company, but he did the entire time that this was. Okay. He was working as their field agent. Okay, all right, I'm fine. No more questions. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't hear anything here. I mean, it sounds like he was essentially a party chief for a surveying company. And there was just some misunderstanding, I guess, from the complainant as to what land surveyor meant. You know? Right, right. And I think, you know, our, our field people hold themselves out as land surveyors, not, right. you know, they're not claiming licensure. That's just the profession. Right, right. 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 And at, yeah, at the time I wrote this, I just didn't have, for some reason, the respondent's attorney didn't give me a whole lot of information. And I think that's probably because this is currently being litigated. So once I got more, I, I would have presented this probably a little bit differently, but. Is this something we need to perhaps let that litigation work its way through and then bring back? Because perhaps more details might come to light. I mean, it, that is up to you. Um, we can, I mean, we can close and flag it and I can follow up with the, I can ask the attorney to follow up with me once that's concluded and we can reopen it or we can leave it in a litigation monitoring status and it, and it stays on as open. I think I'd feel more comfortable if we let the litigation work its way through and then readdress this with the new facts that come light. And then if it's a simple dismissal to dismissal, but if there's more to it here, kind of smoke and fire type thing, you know, you're seeing some smoke here, but okay. I'm not seeing any fire quite yet. Um, you know, again, if it's dismissed, we can dismiss it real quick, but if there is something here that gives us the opportunity to pursue it. Okay. So we can put it in say. a... That's what I would recommend. Okay. So um, the recommendation would be to put it in a litigation monitoring status, and I'll bring it back to you once I have that civil suit uh, judgment or conclusion. Mm -hmm. So um, your recommendation would be just to, well, I guess, excuse me, your, um, potentially your motion would be to accept counsel's recommendation then with that? Is that how I read that? So moved. All right. So we've got a motion from uh, Mr. Kaufman. Do we have a second? A second. A second from Mr. Martin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, that motion is approved. Looks like number two. Number two is 2024025721. Complainant alleges their neighbors are attempting to take their property and have hired three different surveyors to do so. Complainant alleges respondent worked with their neighbor 
to conspire to steal a portion of their property. Complainant also claims respondent intentionally broke the law in order to get this job. Complainant alleges over one third of an acre has been stolen from them as well as countless tax dollars. Respondent stated that they established the boundary according to the landowner's deed and the field evidence found. Respondent explains that they are between three to six months backlog like most surveyors in that area and denies the allegation that they broke the law to get the job. So an expert review uh, was conducted of this matter and all the documentation that was provided to me. Respondent included a detailed narrative providing details of the survey, including found pins in possession, boundary determination logic, and details of their conversation with complainant. Respondent also provided the survey that was produced and potentially recorded, the respondent's client's deed, complainant's deed, and the raw file for the field survey work. The expert found the respondent's survey appears to have reasonable positions based on found corners and existing possession. The found corners shown on the survey are not adequately described as called for in the standards of practice. Uh, it's also not clear with the information provided whether or not the respondent properly notified the complainant of the deed overlap as called for in our statute. Uh, there clearly was dialogue between resp respondent and complainant, so the expert notes that this may be a non-issue. Um, you know, it wasn't included in the complaint. So the expert made a suggestion that respondents should be informed that they need to properly describe monuments and remind them they need to notify adjoiners when discrepancies arise in the boundary locations. So based on all of that, um, I thought the most appropriate action would be not to issue formal discipline, but to issue a letter of warning, um, including all these details noted by the expert reviewer. <clears throat> The letter of warning, though, is it that's something that goes on their record? And yes. Isn't there a difference between that and letter of caution? Well, um, I think in the past there may have been a little bit of confusion or just some attorneys have used those words. But a letter of warning is kept in our file. Um, it's considered anytime there's future complaints or future you know, possibility of discipline. But a letter of warning is not reported on our disciplinary action report, which is published every month. And it's not reported to any kind of national database. Okay. Good. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the, uh, with the recommendation there for the letter of warning. It's, uh, I mean, the violations that occurred are, are minor relative to the big picture of what's going on here um i feel comfortable with you know issuing that letter of warning i don't think i don't think it warrants formal disciplinary action uh to this point um it sounds reasonable i feel very comforted that uh that they did authorize a um a review of this um i think that was the right action there and uh, I, was, I was glad to hear that 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 if there was a, a violation as minor as it was so i'm, I'm comfortable with the letter of warning All right. Well, then we will need a uh, motion in that regard. Was that a motion, uh, Mr. It was Paul? a motion. All yes. right. Very well. Then uh, we need a second. A second. Got a second from Mr. Martin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, then uh, that motion was approved. Number three. Okay. Number three is 2024019771. <clears throat> Complainant is a licensed land surveyor in Tennessee. Complainant alleges respondent reached out to them unsolicited via an email in April of 2024, offering their services. So respondent is not a licensed land surveyor. The email states that complainant is reaching out to respondent to let them know they have continued to update and improve their process at their drone company and recently acquired the new DJI L2 LiDAR system. Is Correct. That, okay. Uh, complainant states that if respondent is in the market, they offer drone photogrammetry, uh, LiDAR and thermal inspections. Complainant further states that with over 53,000 acres mapped, certified thermographers, and PIX40 mapper, certified processors, they know how to get the job done and have great prices. Uh, I include that because I wanted you to know what this email said, because uh, I know that that's going to be where this, where decision falls. Um, respondent states that they are the right partner if complainant needs high quality maps, geolocated as-built, 
survey accurate contours, thermal analysis reports, volumetric calculations, job progress documentation, or 3D models. So complainant responded to the email, and I think they were very concerned about possible unlicensed land surveying or holding yourself out that way. So they, they asked, are you currently working with a surveyor or are you looking to work with a surveyor? I asked because it looks like you already provide topographic and planimetric surveying services. So respondents stated they work with multiple different local uh, surveyors and can provide, quote, essentially all the required services just without the stamp, of course. My personal background comes from working in a survey office, end quote. Complainant also provided a screenshot of a profile for the complainant from something that looks similar to the LinkedIn, which I don't know what it is. I just tell you um, that it looks similar, so it's some sort of profile for working services. Um, and that profile states that complainant is a drone pho photogrammetry, photogrammetry specialist offering photogrammetry, mapping, contours, 3D modeling, aerial photography, and videography. Uh, and that's all that profile says. So respondent states they contacted complainant to offer their drone services to complainant's firm. They market their services to land surveyors and engineers. Um, they argue that they make it clear that they offer collection services only and do not claim to be surveyors. They note that if complainant would have continued to engage with them and signed any relevant work order, they would have seen a disclaimer on their paperwork that says they provide data capture only and do not claim to be professional surveyors or engineers. Deliverables are for informational purposes only and are not suitable for making measurements with survey grade accuracy unless validated and confirmed by a licensed surveyor or engineer. So respondent notes they felt like they were having a casual conversation by email and they were actually declaring the opposite of what complainant is alleging. I don't find any clear evidence of unlicensed activity, um, so my recommendation is dismissal. Well, <clears throat> this one opens kind of a can of worms and, and something that um, in, in the future this board is going to have to address in a little more detail. Um, we've... We've not regulated aerial mapping per se uh, historically in this state. A lot of other states do. So that's something we're going to have to address uh, one way or another in the future. Um, in this particular case, it looks to me like I mean, we don't have any evidence that they've offered these services to the public. Correct. It's, right. There's no website or anything that I can I mean, find. So, so long as they're only offering to be a service provider to licensed surveyors, that makes it kind of hard to, to, to really see a lot here. Now, there is a little bit of issue. I mean, if, if they are claiming to do volumetric calculations and things like that, those are, yeah, it is insinuating survey grade measurements. Um, okay. Um, on the other hand, they say they don't do that, and they specifically disclaim that in their agreement. So I don't know. that. But again, is with it being you know in partnership with a licensed land surveyor, I don't know that there's a lot to to do at this point until we see evidence that they're they're going outside of that limitation. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I, I was thinking like as as an extreme example, let's say that because it sounds like this guy maybe worked for a surveyor, so he probably knows the ins and outs and a lot of the calculations and everything. Let's say as an example. I was a surveyor and now I'm doing drone mapping and I do everything that a surveyor does but I stamp on it not an actual survey or some disclaimer so that I'm not on the hook. Everything is the same as a surveyor but I've used the disclaimer I'm not a surveyor this is not an, a, an actual survey. Where would that fall in court or in, in our eyes? It depends on who you did it for, I guess. That's that's kind of what it comes back to. As long as you're doing that under, you know, you know as a essentially a subconsultant to a licensed surveyor, it's, you know, then that onus in my mind falls on that surveyor to validate the information they got from that provider before putting their stamp on it, because they're ultimately responsible for what goes out um, in that finished product. But if they weren't, if they weren't doing that for, so this is like just I've got a Facebook page and hey. I'll, you know, I'll do it for half price. Did I know everything they do, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not this big organization, and I just stamp on it, hey, not a legal survey. Is that, 
It, it sounds you know, like that, that would be that would encroaching, cross, right? Yeah, yeah, that would, that cross, would cross the line because, you know, in my mind, our, you know, we're, we're specifically our charge is to protect the public. Correct. And so if that person is interfacing with the public and providing those services at that point, that that's a pretty clear cut problem. But if it's going through the purview of a licensed surveyor who's taking responsibility for that work, that changes things quite a bit. Like so. impersonating an officer, basically, right? So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Get pulled over, and I'm not actually hey. a police officer. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's almost okay, right? I got those right? lights last <laughs> yeah. night at, uh, you it's know, personal, Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, good discussion. Thanks for the, uh, the scenario. That's good, good call. Uh, uh, I know. I know you got got some thoughts here, Jay. <laughs> oh, so. Save it for last. Save it for last. <laughs> I see how you work that floor. They come in. I get that. Okay. All right. Uh, you're absolutely right. In one thing, you're opening a can of worms here, uh, and this is something that's going to become more pervasive as we go along, with the advent of, of UAS drones and lidar, et cetera. Um, one thing I would like to kind of modify on one of the statements that, that you put in there that we don't regulate photogrammetry. Directly, we don't, but indirectly, we do. Um, and I fall back on, on the category of surveys entitled remote sensing, uh, in which case we do address uh, photogrammetric generation of contours that the surveyor has to have control, I shouldn't use that word yet, has to have supervision over the ground control associated with photogrammetry. I'm not trying to keep it down, trying to keep it down here. Um, in, in the process of photogrammetry, whether you're using an airplane, or these days, most likely using a drone. The process is the same, all right? Don't, don't, don't think that drones are gonna get categorized any differently than using it the, the old school airplane way. It's the same thing. The, the surveyor who is going to use the contours and elevations and polymetry on his survey is directly responsible for the ground control that generates those contours, okay? The ground control is the base. X, Y, Z on the control, and then they fly with a drone or an airplane and they generate their contours relative to that ground control. So the ground control is the basis from which the relativity of the contours is generated. That's directly from our rules that the surveyor is responsible for. So we do have some regulation in photogrammetry. We don't regulate the process in which the contours are generated. We don't say you have to use this software or this model drone or anything like that. But the base from which the contours are relative to is directly tied to survey. So that's where I'm getting a little, little, little vague here in terms of perhaps there was some violation. However, however, I also say along those same lines that it's the surveyor himself that's responsible for knowing that I, that I as the surveyor who am subcontracting out to this, in this case, drone operator, I am responsible for that control. I don't necessarily put that on the drone operator. I put that on the surveyor. And if, if the surveyor is going to hire this third party, that surveyor who has direct responsibility for that product that he's going to put on his stamp survey is responsible for that control. And if he's going to hire that third party, he needs to say, Yes, you can do the drone. Yes, you can take the photos. Yes, you can process and generate contours from my ground control. I'm in charge of the ground control because the rules say I am. So I put that more on the surveyor than I do on the drone operator. Now, the good drone operator would know and would say, hey, I'm going to be glad to fly this for you for X dollars, but you've got to come out here and set control, or I can do it under your supervision, which is commonly the case. So that that's... One place where I'm a little fuzzy with. The second point um, in terms of offering surveying services is, is this drone operator offering surveying services? The, the one place that I find some issue with was if they were offering volumetric calculations. You touched on that briefly. That that's in our definition of survey, straight up. For the purpose of determining areas and volumes. So if, again, again, this all falls back to is the surveyor hi who's hiring the third party, is he setting or supervising the ground control that establishes the contours? Now, can he do that and then ask the third party to calculate volume from it? Yes, absolutely, he can do that. But that doesn't take away any responsibility from that stamp going on, the, on, that, on that survey. So... 
Again, to use that reference, there is definitely some smoke here, and it's, it's a vague area. This is just one of those things that's becoming more prevalent because drones are available to anybody. Anybody can go to Best Buy and buy a drone and offer these services. You buy a drone, you buy some software, a little more hardware, you figure out what you're doing from a couple of YouTube videos, and you're out throwing business cards left and right. Now, I don't see anywhere in here where surveying services directly are offered. I'm glad I don't see that, where he doesn't say, I'm doing topo surveys, I'm doing surveys. And I don't see where he's throwing, quote, boundary lines or anything. I don't see that. We've addressed that in some other issues before in the past. So I feel, I feel better about that. This guy really kind of touches the fringe. I think, he's, I think this guy is smart enough to know not to go out and offer surveys, so to speak, but rather to offer a product that surveyors could use in their ultimate stamped product. Um, I, I really think it falls a little bit more on the surveyor hiring this third party to know his rules. Perhaps he took a good minimum standards refresher in Tennessee and understand and work with the third party uh, to say, look, either I'm going to go out and set that control or you're under my supervision when you set the control yourself and I'll accept it. So I, my suggestion here would be similar to the one earlier, a letter of warning to this third party provider. Again, we don't have any disciplinary action on, on this third party provider, but I think, I think a letter of warning just saying, look, you know, what you're doing, we don't see any direct violations directly here, but boy, you're touching on, on getting a little sensitive here and to remind you that, that a, if you're producing a product for a survey, survey, capital S survey, there needs to be direct relationship from that RLS onto your production of this product, whether it's setting ground control or full reliance under his supervision that, that this third party is doing so. I love how you folded in minimum standards there. That was a yeah, good that move. Yeah. Very <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any comments or anything that you want to add? No, I think that is appropriate. No, um, responsible charge. You know, that's sort of the the, the catchphrase of the day. So, um, glad you sort of highlighted that, reiterated that. So, yeah. But, um, so we'll need a motion then for a letter of warning, um, just reminding them of those uh, those boundaries. You know, the, I will make that motion. All right. Now I need a second. A second. Got a second for Mr. Martin. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? All right, hearing none, that motion is approved. Number four. Okay, number four is 2024030471. So this complainant was opened against Respondent, who is a licensed engineering firm, as a result of a complaint that I just presented at our last meeting in May. That complaint had been made by a licensed land surveyor against an unlicensed individual who is a partner at this respondent firm. Um, and that individual partner had forged the complainant seal and stamp on a drawing. Um, the board assessed the unlicensed individual a $4,000 civil penalty, and they have signed that consent order and paid the fine already. Um, and then in your decision, you also decided to open this complaint against the respondent's firm for possible unlicensed activity and to verify if the business is operating without a licensed land surveyor in responsible charge. So the, uh, the other partner, they, they are brothers, which I've come to find out after I wrote this. So um, the partner that did not get penalized responded to this complaint and stated that their firm does not offer surveying services. Respondent has and continues to partner with various licensed land surveyors on projects requiring survey information. The complainant is one of those. They just didn't review the survey at issue that led to that $4,000 civil penalty. Um, as indicated in the response, that individual's response to the original complaint, who was penalized due to time pressures that partner issued a drawing that did not include collaboration with the licensed land surveyor who often partners with respondent. Since October of 2020, when respondent's licensed land surveyor passed away, the firm has not offered land surveying services and has not had a licensed land surveyor on staff. 
Respondent is a civil engineering firm offering land development services to their clients. All surveying work, with this notable exception, is handled by outside firms either independently or in conjunction with respondent's work by their firm where appropriate. Respondent does help coordinate activities when tied to engineering projects, but the work is done outside of their firm. So based on all of that, um, I didn't see it necessary to penalize the firm again for this individual's actions, and as you know, is a pretty severe penalty. That individual took full responsibility. I do know that, and the brother kind of wanted me to kind of just touch on this, that that almost dissolved their partnership. It's been a really difficult situation for them. Um, I just didn't, uh, as anybody would guess, I just didn't see it necessary to you know do a double um, kind of punishment. Um, so my recommendation is just to issue a letter of warning regarding um, that managing partners fraudulent acts and just being careful in the future that this doesn't happen again and you always use a licensed land surveyor if you're gonna continue. Uh, but I did have a question to the board that I'm, um, I'm a little bit confused about whether a firm has to employ the licensed land surveyor in cases like this because to me it seems like it's a little bit cloudy in our rules I feel like it says you have to employ a, a licensed land surveyor and responsible charge, but then I've also, there's been talk about that you can source that, outs, outsource that. I mean, my understanding of our rules has always been that yes, there has to be a surveyor and responsible charge for each location that you offer services. Now this is a little strange because they say they don't offer the services. Right but they actually do the work. Right, it's um, like, it, it's internal, like to their, I guess their product, there's some drawings. So I, mean, I just, I feel like that needs to be kind of discussed and made clear so I can correctly write this letter and instruct this firm. I mean, it, based on the, you know, the violation that did happen suggests, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess they're kind of claiming that was a one-off, but it does sound like they tend to do the data processing and drafting side of things and then, you know, and that gets into the whole plan stamping um, issue where, you know, it brings up a lot of questions about was there responsible charge from the surveyor. Um, and that's why we require that there be a licensed land surveyor at each location um, to oversee that work. So what, what are your thoughts, Jay? Yeah, it, it's kind of a unique situation. Um, you know, either either you're all in or you're or you're not in at all. You're either an RLS on staff with field crews and engineering, typical to most civil survey type companies, or you're strictly a civil company and you outsource and third party survey. This one here seems to kind of have a little little blend of both, which is unusual. Um, but ultimately, again, I fall back on ultimately it's the stamp's responsibility. It's, it's that licensed surveyor who they have subcontracted out to perform the surveying services here for the civil engineering firm. That's, that's where it all falls. That's, that's the privilege of being, being stamped. <laughs> um, uh, to kind of fall back on the issue here, I, I agree. I think, I think they've been hit once already. I, I kind of think that this might be the 4,000 that we addressed in the budget. Yes. Okay, yes. so obviously they were pretty quick to, to pay it off. They were. Um, and obviously have, have admitted to the consent order and, and all that good stuff, check the boxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, do, I do go with the letter of warning suggestion. I think, I think that's the right course here. I think, I think the punishment for the crime performed has been served. Um, and I think for what we're addressing here, uh, uh, the letter of warning to the respondent is, is the right course here. Um, this, so this is one of those things that I'm hoping that they have fixed internally, um, got a better line of communication is what seemed to be the initial problem here was communication between the, the stamp and the, and the engineering firm itself. Um, but boy, they are, they are kind of walking on some thin ice here. I'm, I'm certainly hope that they got their, their stuff together. I was, I was sorry to see that they had you know, lost their license surveyor and passed away some years ago. Obviously they're trying to you know, kind of put a band-aid on the situation. Now they're subbing out to a surveyor. I'm not sure what kind of agreement or something they've got between each other. But again, that's kind of falling back on the old case here and not, not addressing this directly. But, but I tend to agree with the staff's uh, uh, suggestion of a letter of warning. I was just going to ask, if I think we heard 
a couple of cases that were similar at one point. But was this uh, Kentucky licensed in Kentucky and also, I mean, licensed in Tennessee and Kentucky? Or is it, am I thinking of a different case? A different case. I think, I think it's, it's different. It's a different case. Yeah. All right. Um, Jay, was that a motion then to accept council's recommendation? That was a motion All to right. accept council's recommendation. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? A second. We have a second from Mr. Martin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, we're ready for number five. Okay, this is the last one. It's 2024029091. Complainant alleges respondent came out to their property in May of this year and asked them if it was okay to do a land survey for a neighboring property, noting that they would also be on that complainant's property during their field work. Complainant gave respondent permission. Respondent went out in May and completed a survey with their assistant. Cons complainant alleges respondent was incorrect with their stake placement. Complainant alleges respondent is attempting to steal their property and give it to somebody else. Respondent states they were hired by complainant's neighbor to survey their property because an adjoining landowner, who is one of the residents that lives on the complainant's property, had dug a ditch across their driveway with a backhoe and the neighbor had no way to access their property after that was done. The landowner told respondent that the neighbor told them that it was their driveway and the landowner had no right to use it. By the time respondent had arrived, the ditch had been filled back in. Respondent states they pulled all relevant deeds necessary to survey our property as they always do. The deed clearly stated that the landowner uh, has an easement for ingress and egress to their property. Respondent spoke with complainant and their husband, who likely is the one that dug that ditch, and told them they were going to survey the property for the neighboring landowner. Respondent surveyed it according to the specific deed. Respondent states someone from complainant's family asked them to then survey their property and respondent informed them it would be in their best interest to get another surveyor. Um, complainant provides no evidence or documentation of any kind to support their allegations and it appears to be a property and boundary dispute. So my recommendation is dismissal. Yeah, this, this looks like kind of the standard ones we get. Um, or I don't see any violation here. Uh, yeah, I tend to agree. From from what's provided here, I don't see any direct uh, violations. Um, smart, smart on the surveyor to recommend get a another surveyor to, to survey the neighbor's property. Smart move on his part. Um, and I hope I hope that they follow up on that and, and get that resolved. But uh, from from what where we're at right here, uh, from what's explained to us, I, I don't see any I don't see anything there, and, and agree with the council's recommendation for dismissal. All right, we have a motion from Mr. Kaufman. Is that the case? I'll make a motion that we accept the yes. Uh, All right. Breaking, uh, trying breaking. to throw me off my, uh, off my right. game, aren't you? Right. I see what you're doing. Right. We got a motion from Mr. Martin. Do we have a second? I will second that. We got a second from Mr. Kaufman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, hearing none, uh, that motion is approved. And that concludes the legal report. Thank you. I know that was a, a long one. Good. A lot well of done. words. Very well done. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now we need somebody to say photogametry five times fast. <laughs> right. I really fumbled that. I'm sorry. I was intimidated by that word. It doesn't cool. happen often. Yeah. And then the PLSS meeting, I was sweating bullets over here. I thought K uh, Jay was going to have me explain that, you know. Um, so uh, how did our uh, vice chairman do? I, I know you got to report back to Gary. He's going to be waiting on that. Did he do okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I just handed it over to, to Mr. Director. <laughs> All right, good meeting. It looks like we covered a lot of ground in an efficient amount of time. We do, um, uh, we, part of our new bids typically um, is to accept PDHs or make a motion in that regard. Um, so I'll leave that to you and then any other new business that you may have. I'll make a motion. It's 1020. I'll make the motion for one PDH. Um, do we have a second? A second. All in, uh, we've got a second for Mr. Uh, Martin. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, There's uh, that motion was uh, accepted. Do we have any other new business? All right, um, Vice Chair, you can uh, hit the gavel then and uh, adjourn this meeting if you like. All right, meeting adjourned. All right, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to let you all know I will not be here for this meeting. <laughs> uh -huh.